1861 and the beginning of the American Civil War. We're going to be talking about the uh, Civil War in the American West. And ordinarily, when people talk about or think about the Civil War, they think of the North and the South. And the West often doesn't uh, come into the equation. There was, uh, there was some activity, there was some fighting, quite a bit of fighting in some parts of the American West. But also, just in case you, you didn't read between the lines in the previous section, the, uh, the Civil War, which was about slavery, was actually not caused by the existence of slavery because there had been slavery in the South for some time, nor was it caused by northern states wanting to end slavery in the South because in the beginning of the Civil War, uh, the majority of people in the northern states didn't want to do that. The Civil War was caused by slavery expanding into the American West. So in a very real way, you cannot tell the story of the Civil War without giving the American West a large role. Well, uh, this map, uh, just to, uh, to clarify, it has states divided between free states in dark blue and slave states in gray. Light blue areas are not states at all, but were territories. And all the gray states did not join the Confederacy. That magenta line that starts in West Texas and goes all the way up uh, uh, separating Virginia from West Virginia, um, below that was the Confederacy. There were several slave states, Delaware and Maryland, Kentucky and Missouri, who uh, did not join the Confederacy. And there was even part of one slave state, the western counties of Virginia, that broke away from Virginia to remain in the Union. But before we talk about the actions in the West during the war, let's briefly take a step back and just kind of summarize some things that had gone on out West in the 1850s, a couple of which we may have already talked about. Uh, the first being the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851. And I bring this up again because it's going to be important for things that happen during the Civil War in the Northern Plains area. So that treaty had been between the U.S. government and eight different Northern Plains tribes, which you can see uh, where the territory to those various tribes was uh, around that treaty area. Uh, in which the, the tribes guaranteed safe passage for settlers going to Oregon in exchange for annuities, uh, a payment, uh, an annual payment from the U.S. government to these tribes, often in the form of trade goods and particularly in the form of food, because by allowing all those settlers to come through their, their hunting territory, all these tribes, uh, although some more than others, were losing access to a lot of their hunting. And so that was, uh, that was the fair exchange that was made. Also, the, uh, the treaty allowed the U.S. government to build roads and forts inside the treaty area. Well, uh, that treaty led to several years of peace, most of the 1850s, until 1859, when gold was discovered at Pikes Peak, just south of Denver, Colorado, in Cheyenne and Arapaho Territory. It was, uh, it was not in the treaty territory from the Fort Laramie Treaty. It was, uh, it was south of it. But events there are going to impact those tribes which had signed the 1851 Treaty, and the Cheyenne were one of them. Well, when the Civil War started. There were, uh, there had already been tension in Colorado with all the miners that had come pouring in and with the, uh, the local Indians, the Cheyenne and their Arapaho allies. And there had been fighting, fighting between the settlers and the local Indians. But when the war started, Colorado, which was uh, not part of the Confederacy, but which was uh, a territory of the uh, 
uh, the United States. It was it was a, a a union bastion. The the people in Colorado were overwhelmingly pro union. Um, when the war started, the federal troops who had been stationed in Colorado Territory were withdrawn because they had to go fight the Confederates, right? And when that happened, the citizens of Colorado Territory, which was about 30,000 people, felt vulnerable. They felt vulnerable to the, uh, the Cheyenne. And by the way, I have here pictured some Cheyenne dog soldiers. That was one of the military societies, probably the most famous uh, among the, uh, the Cheyenne people. So the uh, Colorado citizens felt vulnerable to the Indians and also to the Confederates. In 1861, the uh, Treaty of Fort Wise was signed, and the leaders of some of the Cheyenne and Arapaho bands agreed to give up their lands, to cede their lands, and to go live on a reservation at Sand Creek in Colorado. The dog soldiers, whom I just mentioned, uh, they refused to sign on to this treaty. They refused to give up their, uh, their claim to their territory. They refused to go live on a reservation. They stayed outside the reservation and, in fact, continued fighting against the uh, settlers, which... Uh, was something that was problematic for the settlers because, again, the federal troops had been withdrawn and even the Colorado militia had been mobilized. Uh, this, was, this was what happened frequently in the Civil War, just as had happened in the American Revolution. You had, on both sides, you had the regular army, uh, which was the uh, national army, and you also had many state militias which were the equivalent of today's National Guards, that were basically mobilized and made a part of the military of either the Union or the Confederacy. So those Colorado militiamen wound up, uh, uh, they wound up being part of Union forces. And in fact, they were involved in the most important Civil War battle of the American West took place in New Mexico in March of 1862 at a place called Glorietta Pass. Uh, at this place, the Union forces, which were mostly from Colorado and were co-led by Colonel John Chivington, who was uh, a, uh, uh, a pastor in his uh, pre-military life, uh, and the Confederates were made up of forces mostly from Texas. In fact, uh, uh, the, there were several, I think there were three Texas regiments there. Uh, in, in the picture, by the way, the, uh, uh, the flag, the red flag with the white star, was the, uh, the flag of the, I think, the 5th Texas Volunteer Infantry, and, uh, or Mounted Infantry, and overall the flag of the Confederate Forces of New Mexico. Uh, over on the Union side, there was a regiment called the New Mexico Volunteer Infantry uh, that was made up of Mexican-American soldiers fighting for the Union. This was an important battle because the Confederacy wanted to break the Union's hold on the West because they wanted to be able to get access to California. They wanted to be able to take some of the territory in the West uh, because uh, it had valuable resources the Confederate Army could use. However, it didn't work because the Union forces won the day, um, co-led again by John Chivington, and soundly defeated the Confederates. And this has uh, sometimes been called the Gettysburg of the West because it was a turning point in the war, but it was at the early part, just one year into the war, this effectively ended the Confederacy's efforts to try to get um, a strong foothold in the American West. That's why it was such, such an important battle. Now we're going to come back and revisit the forces who fought in this battle 
and look at them in context of what was going on back in their home territory in Colorado. But first, let's move a little further east, but still in the west, to Kansas. Specifically, the, uh, the border area between Kansas and Missouri. Remember, in the 1850s, this had been bleeding Kansas when uh, pro-slavery forces and abolitionist forces had uh, had sort of a small-scale civil war among themselves. In fact, it was kind of like a, a dress rehearsal for the Civil War. Uh, when the Civil War actually starts, things heat up even more in Kansas and Missouri. So, uh, you've got, uh, essentially, in addition to the Union and Confederate forces, the official forces, you also had guerrilla groups. Uh, guerrilla groups, or, um, well, partisan groups, are not official. They're not a mobilized militia. They're kind of an informal, ad hoc military group that attaches itself to the cause of one or the other sides. The difference being, uh, they're not necessarily part of the chain of command. They don't necessarily represent the government of the uh, side that they're supporting, although they do represent the goals and, and the people of that side. So in the Union, you had the, the Jayhawks, alias the Red Legs, led by Jim Lane, who would later be a senator from Kansas, and headquartered in the city, uh, the small town, really, of Lawrence, Kansas, which, as you will recall, we talked about earlier, was, uh, was sacked by pro-slavery forces during the Bleeding Kansas era, and a lot of property was destroyed, and one guy got accidentally killed when some bricks fell on his head. Um, the Confederate forces uh, included pro the most prominent Confederate guerrilla leader, the guy on the far left, William Clark Quantrill, who was actually not a Southerner. I think he was from Ohio. Uh, he had moved into Kansas um, as a school teacher and got fired from his job. And he had some hard feelings about the people of Kansas. And he sympathized with the Confederacy. So he led a large group of, of guerrillas who were particularly known for their ruthlessness, although the other side was pretty ruthless as well. Uh, another uh, guerrilla leader was the guy in the middle, Bloody Bill Anderson. Now, uh, Anderson uh, was one of several guerrilla leaders uh, in Missouri who acted sometimes under the command, overall command of Quantrill, and sometimes these bands acted independently. Now, a couple of other people who were not so famous at the time but would become famous later that rode with Quantrill were these two brothers from Missouri, the James brothers, Frank James and his younger brother, Jesse James. Also, their cousin, I think it was their first cousin, Cole Younger, and some of his younger, younger brothers. Now, uh, the James brothers and the younger brothers, including the older younger brothers and the younger younger brothers, who were cousins of the James brothers, all became, post-Civil War, one of the m most famous outlaw bands in the American West, got their start as Quantrill's Raiders. Uh, Buddy Bill Anderson, by the way, uh, in combination with another guerrilla from an area that was almost as violent, the Tennessee-Kentucky border, an uh, individual named Champ Ferguson, uh, the, uh, the figure that we've uh, uh, maybe looked at before, uh, the, the famous Clint Eastwood, the classic Clint Eastwood movie from 1976, The Outlaw, Josie Wales, based on a novel uh, called Gone to Texas. Uh, Josie Wales, not a historical figure, but kind of was a combination of the stories and persona of Champ Ferguson and Bloody Bill Anderson. Well, that sack of Lawrence that I've uh, mentioned a couple of times, uh, as, as we discussed, didn't lead to uh, 
a large loss of life, just some property damage. That was the first one. The second one was a different story. When Quantrill and uh, Bloody Bill Anderson and several bands, hundreds of Confederate guerrillas, swept into the town full of vengeful fury uh, in August of 1863. Why were they full of vengeful fury? Well, uh, the relatives of some of the guerrillas down in Missouri had been rounded up and arrested for giving comfort, aid and comfort to the guerrillas, including uh, several women that, uh, that were the, uh, uh, the relatives of some of the guerrillas, including, I think, uh, some cousins of Jesse and Frank James and the beloved sister of Bloody Bill Anderson, and they were arrested and taken to Kansas City, to the Kansas City Jail, which was a rock building that, once they were arrested and put in it, mysteriously, for some reason, collapsed, crushing all those uh, women imprisoned inside. The, the families of members of these uh, guerrilla groups that's why they were particularly angry. In fact, it was after the death of his sister that Bloody Bill Anderson started not just killing Union soldiers and Union guerrillas, but scalping them and collecting their scalps uh, that he had hanging on his, hanging on his saddle. Well, uh, they came pouring into Lawrence, Kansas. Jim Lane, leader of the Jayhawks, uh, barely managed to escape in his uh, in his nightshirt by hiding in a cornfield and getting away. Um, not a whole lot of people got away. 183 men were killed in the town of Lawrence. Uh, essentially, the guerrillas came in, set fire to the place, and uh, killed all the adult men or teenagers and, and older that they could find. So that's, uh, that's what uh, Quantrill was most famous for. And again, remember, Jesse and Frank James and Cole Younger and the Younger Brothers were, were part of this action. Uh, it resulted in General Order No. 11 issued by the Union Army that declared martial law in northern Missouri. Martial law means civilians have no, there is no habeas corpus. Uh, you can just be arrested by the military and your rights suspended. Uh, this is uh, under military rules. Uh, during that time, again, some of the relatives of prominent members of the guerrilla groups were killed, including Jesse and Frank James's uh, stepfather, if I'm not mistaken. All right, well... Remember, earlier, I sort of had uh, um, hinted about uh, something that was going to happen. Actually, a couple of things. I had hinted that that Treaty of 1851 is going to be important, particularly the annuities. And I hinted that things are going on in Colorado while the militia is gone with the uh, dog soldiers and stuff. Well, now we're going to look at what happened in those two places, actually, Minnesota is where the first one took place, in Colorado, the second. Now we're going to take a look at a conflict that happened in the, uh, the early part of the Civil War in Minnesota that is known by various names. The, uh, the most common and long-standing name for this conflict is the Dakota Uprising. That's what people called it at the time. Um, also, it's been referred to as the Dakota War or the U.S. Dakota War, which is more accurate than Dakota Uprising. Sometimes it's called Little Crow's War. Um, uprising uh, implies someone rising up against uh, a proper authority, a, a rebellion, 
if you will. And the uh, the Dakota people regarded what they what they were doing regarded themselves as a sovereign people and what they were doing as defending their people, their land, and their sovereignty. So war is a much better appellation for what what took place. Well, let's go back in time a little bit, a little over a decade, to 1851, around the same time that that Fort Laramie Treaty was being signed with those eight Northern Plains tribes, one of which was the Lakota. These are their their relatives, uh, their kinsmen, the Dakota, um, who signed a separate treaty, actually a couple of separate treaties in 1851 that uh, essentially handed over a, a large part of their traditional lands for settlement. Um, in fact, uh, so many people uh, who were going along that Oregon Trail stopped in Minnesota um, that uh, it became a state by the end of that decade. There were enough people for, for that to happen. But just like with the Fort Laramie Treaty with those tribes, the, um, the agreement was that uh, on the part of the U.S., they were going to provide annuities. They were going to provide, in, in particular, food for the various Dakota bands because those Dakota bands were giving up a large portion of their hunting grounds. Well, um, little towns started springing up pretty quickly, and the population, like I said, grew quickly enough that within a few years it became a state. So reliance on those annuities was even more important for the, for the Dakota. However, they didn't usually get them. Uh, they didn't get them on time if they got them at all, and often they didn't get them at all, nor did they get a lot of the other things they were promised. Uh, some of the stuff that was in the treaty was just completely ignored by the U.S. government. And then later on, they took more, more uh, land, including the uh, Pipestone Quarry. Uh, in Pipestone, Minnesota, which is where uh, catlinite or pipestone had been mined uh, by by the Dakota and by their ancestors for uh, for many generations, and was really prized by tribes throughout the region for for their pipes. Well, by the early 1860s, things were getting things were getting pretty rough for the Dakota. Uh, there was there was a drought. They weren't getting the money they were supposed to be getting. Turns out that uh, some of the government agents who were supposed to be distributing the food to the Dakota were actually keeping it and selling it on the black market to settlers uh, for well, I would say for a considerable profit. But since it was free for them, everything was it was all profit, right? Uh, and it wasn't going to the Indians for whom it was intended by treaty. Um, they managed to get some food on credit from some of the government agents, some of the government traders, um, but they refused to extend the, uh, the Indians any, any more credit, uh, which was uh, really uh, putting them in a bind because they weren't getting the money either that they were supposed to get. Finally, at one point, several of the, uh, several of the Dakota leaders went to one of those uh, government uh, agents, government uh, traders, asking for food that was due them, um, or at the very least credit, to get food. And he said, because they said their children were starving, and he said, there's plenty of grass around here. Let them eat grass, which, which did not help things at all. Um, this really, really ratcheted up a lot of tension between the Dakotas and, and the settlers. And it all came to a head in the summer of 1862 with uh, an inciting incident. A lot of times, all it takes when there's this much tension is one spark. And that spark happened when a group of, uh, group of young Dakota men were out on a, on a hunting party and these were these were young men. These were not like seasoned warriors. And uh, they they went to this farm and snuck into the hen house and, and stole some of the eggs. And the lady of the house 
caught him in the act. And she came out with her broom, waving her broom around and yelling at him, you know. And she cornered one of them uh, there in the, in the, the hen house in the, or in the barn uh, and just smacked the crap out of him with her broom, you know. And he ran away with her, whacking him with a broomstick. And all of his friends made fun of him. Ha, ha, ha. Old white lady beat you with a broom. That's hilarious. So he was pretty embarrassed. So he went back and killed her and everybody else that was home. Uh, which also is not the way to improve relations. This immediately erupted into a large-scale war between the Dakotas and and the settlers. Uh, and the Dakotas mobilized. Now, the, the, the bands in the northern part of the state uh, were not interested in fighting and didn't participate, but the bands in the south did uh, several of them, particularly the Santee Dakota, uh, and uh, the overall leader, the military leader of the uh, the Dakota force was this guy, uh, Little Crow. And the fighting, the fighting got uh, it got really, really bad, um, in part because the Civil War is going on, and Minnesota, you know, is a state. Minnesota is a Union state, so. A lot of the fighting age men in Minnesota had been mobilized into regiments and sent off to fight the war. Uh, so uh, that put the uh, put the settlers at a big disadvantage, and the uh, the Dakotas came through and um, uh, they faced off against the the militia that the Minnesotans did come up with, which was commanded by uh, General Henry Hastings Sibley who had been the previous governor of Minnesota. Um, and they swept through several towns. Uh, they destroyed some small towns completely, burned them to the ground, and killed most of the people in them. Um, towns like Milford, Milford, Leavenworth, and Sacred Heart. Um, it's estimated, by the time all was said and done, um, we know that there were 77 uh, Minnesota militia soldiers killed. And there were about 150 Dakota warriors killed. Um, the civilian uh, civilian casualties estimates range anywhere from a minimum of 400 and 450. Uh, some estimates take it to, to double double that. So it's safe to say at least 450 civilians were killed uh, in this uh, very brief but very intense war. And there were depredations. There were depredations on on both sides, as there tended to be when you had uh, militia fighting uh, fighting Indians on the frontier like this. And some of the some of the depredations were uh, pretty uh, disturbing stuff. You know, there were uh, uh, pregnant women killed, um, various other things. Finally, though, the uh, the Dakota forces were defeated decisively defeated Little Crow and his son, I think his oldest son, managed to escape capture uh, and they were uh, on a farm uh, gathering berries to eat uh, and the farmer saw them and there was a $25 bounty on the head of any Dakota Indians. Um, and so he shot him dead and he got 500 bucks because this was, uh, this was Little Crow the leader. Meanwhile, the Indians who had been captured, the warriors, who had participated in, uh, in the violence, uh, they were captured and 303 of them were put on trial in Minnesota. So this is a trial by their peers, which means 12 white guys from Minnesota. And you can imagine how that went, especially considering the fact most of these uh, um, uh, accused, didn't speak any English, were not told what was even going on, certainly had no access to defense lawyers, and most of the, most of the trials took about, on the average, five minutes. In fact, they conducted 40-some trials in one day. So, uh, you know, just exactly how, how well-researched and how well-proven things were is certainly, uh, certainly up, for, up for doubt. But uh, all 303 were convicted 
and sentenced to be executed, uh, which uh, brings President Abraham Lincoln into the story. He was actually already brought into the story because um, the, uh, the governor of Minnesota had, had appealed to President Lincoln to send troops to help put this uh, uprising down, and he had uh, troops under General John Pope, a famous uh, Union general. Uh, that's what had helped seal the deal for the victory over the Dakotas. But now he has this situation where up in Minnesota, they're, uh, they're planning to execute 303 Indians all at the same time. And that puts him, that puts him in a bit of a bind. It puts him between a rock and a hard place because on the one hand, the people of Minnesota, the white people of Minnesota, pretty darn ticked off. Uh, about these Indians, and they, you know, they want to kill all of them if they could. Many of them would just kill all the Indians. Um, so a lot of anger, a lot of anger there, a lot of desire for retaliation and revenge. At the same time, here we are. It's uh, just one year into the Civil War. There's uh, there's a lot of uh, things to consider diplomatically on the international scale, because. You may, may or may not be aware of this. You probably are. The Confederate States of America was seeking recognition from European countries. Uh, they were seeking support from countries like England and France. Obviously, the United States didn't want the Confederate States to get that. But if in the United States, all of a sudden, they're executing 303 Indians, particularly if the story gets out that the Indians got mad because their children were starving, that's going to look really bad, uh, really bad. Uh, and it's going to hurt the diplomatic aims of the country. So uh, President Lincoln can't let that happen. But at the same time, he can't let them all go because the people, uh, the white people of Minnesota, the citizens of the state of Minnesota are going to go nuts. So... He looked over, he took about a month and looked over all the evidence and, and all the cases. And ultimately what he did was he commuted the sentences initially of 264 of the 303 Dakota men. Uh, commuted their sentences, um, essentially saying they were not guilty of murder, which is what they had been charged and convicted with. And by the way, how can you charge and convict uh, Indians that th they are not citizens uh, and they are citizens of, of uh, allegedly uh, a semi-autonomous nation? Anyway, not guilty of murder because the killings they had done, he said, were killings in war. So they were acting as soldiers. You don't go around executing the soldiers just because they're on the losing side. Uh, however, of the 40 others... Um, two of them had been uh, charged with and to, uh, to Lincoln's satisfaction from the evidence convicted of rape. The other 38 were convicted of killings that were not in battle, right? They weren't fighting against soldiers or even armed farmers fighting back. Rather, uh, it was uh, the massacre of civilians and women and children. Uh, so those 40, those 40, he did not commute their, their death sentences, except one of them. One of them he did because uh, uh, there was some intercession, I think, from the, uh, the governor of Minnesota who said, I don't think this guy uh, is guilty. So one of them got their sentence commuted. So that took it down. Uh, eventually, it was taken down to 38, 38 Dakota men sentenced to be executed. And, in fact... They were executed uh, in Mankato, Minnesota, on the day after Christmas, 1862. 38 of them put up on one big giant scaffold, and the, uh, the lever was pulled, and in an instant, all 38 of them plunged to their, to their doom. This was the largest mass execution in American history, and remains so. To this day, now the the other Dakotas, uh, including their families, were uh, well. The, the the other men whose sentences were commuted, they were sent to prison. They were put in a prison for uh, some of them up to five years. Uh, 
uh, their families were also uh, put in military prison camps. Uh, and then at the end of that period, all of them were kicked out of the state of Minnesota and put on, um, put on reservations, put on a reservation right across uh, uh, down there across the uh, Nebraska border, northern Nebraska. Uh, some managed to avoid being rounded up and, and taken uh, to the reservation, and they went westward and joined up with their kinsmen, the Lakota, um, in uh, North and South Dakota uh, nearby. And the Lakota and Dakota uh, together, uh, working together, uh, actually over the next couple of years uh, had several raids into, uh, into Minnesota. And the Minnesota militia, once more led by Sibley, had several battles with the Lakota and, and Dakota um, over, the next, over the next couple of years. Um, this is uh, not something, obviously, that the Dakota people ever forgot or ever will forget, but their, their related branch, remember the, the Sioux are, uh, are in three branches, the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota. Um, so what happened to the, to the Dakota in, in the minds of their, of their kinsmen, representatives from all three of those branches were part of the seven council fires, the Ocheti Shakowin. Uh, so whatever happened to the Dakota might as well have happened to the Lakota. So far as the Lakota were concerned, this did not endear them to the United States government. One last thing about the Dakota War that I forgot to mention earlier. I should have mentioned this uh, before I got to the trials. Uh, and the trials, by the way, are uh, uh, implied here in this, this drawing. Here's a little boy identifying one of the... Uh, uh, one of the Dakotas that uh, he witnessed kill somebody. Uh, but uh, Andrew Myrick, the government trader who reportedly said, let them eat grass, he was killed on the first day of the war. And when they found his body, he had grass stuffed down his throat and up his anus. Well, let's... Uh, briefly see what's going on down in the southern plains at this time. Um, the Comanches, you'll recall, and the Kiowas had signed that uh, non-aggression pact slash alliance with the Confederacy, um, but the Confederacy was not going to be a really big factor west of, uh, west of Oklahoma for, for very long. In fact, uh, the, uh, the Confederate Army made an effort to uh, invade New Mexico, uh, hoping to then make their way through to California. And uh, they were repelled by the Union Army in March 1862 at the Battle of Glorietta Pass, which uh, pretty well was uh, the, uh, the end of Confederate ambitions in the West, at least major ones. So uh, the Union is pretty well in control of the Southwest after that, which means that, as I kind of intimated earlier, the Comanches and their Kiowa allies, who had promised not to be attacking any gray jackets, uh, didn't really have that many gray jackets to contend with. So they just uh, went on their merry, merry way uh, attacking uh, uh, non-Confederate people. And there were a whole lot of them along the Santa Fe Trail, headed toward Santa Fe. Uh, and the uh, Comanches uh, and Kiowa and their people uh, uh, Plains Apache uh, allies frequently were making raids and attacking people along that trail. So that by 1864, the, uh, the, the U.S. Army uh, sent Kit Carson, Colonel Kit Carson and his regiment to, uh, uh, to go on a uh, punitive expedition against the Comanches and Kiowas to sort of try to cut out these raids. And it took them a while because so many, uh, so much of the Union Army was, was tied up with fighting the Confederates. And in the Southwest, they had been tied up with fighting Navajos and Apaches up to this point. And I'll touch briefly on that uh, in, in a moment. Uh, so anyway, Kit Carson was already famous uh, before he became 
a military commander in the Civil War. He was famous as a fur trapper and explorer and mountain man, and he was uh, well-versed in, in the ways of, of the Plains Indians. Well, uh, he set off uh, with, his, with his men. He had about, uh, well, not about, he had 335 soldiers under his command, uh, along with 72 uh, native scouts, Utes and Hikariya Apaches. Uh, he also had two artillery pieces, two howitzers, which if you're not familiar with, with a howitzer, it's, it's kind of like a cannon, except it, it operates more like a mortar. It's instead of shooting straight out, it's sort of uh, it's aimed upward and it fires like in a trajectory. So he had two of those. And he went there into the Texas Panhandle, uh, the area where he had uh, he had uh, intelligence that uh, a Kiowa village was located, and he attacked that village. Uh, and very quickly, uh, turned out there were more Kiowa there than he had expected. In fact, he didn't know this at the time, but he was in an area that had several villages, both Kiowa and Comanche. Uh, so uh, he's starting to get uh, outnumbered. And so he and his men fall back to um, the Adobe Walls, which is actually Bent's Fort. Remember we talked about Bent's Fort, William Bent's trading trading post, uh, this little, and it was, if you remember the picture, it looks kind of like a, looked kind of like a fort, but it had been long abandoned and it was collapsed and the walls were crumbling. Uh, so uh, Carson and his men retreated there and uh, uh, set up defensive positions within the walls. There was no roof left. The roof was gone. Uh, but within the walls of the old, uh, the old trading post and one corner he made into a field hospital. And uh, just more and more Comanches and Kiowas start showing up. Uh, in fact, he was facing at least about 1,400 Comanches, Kiowas, and uh, Plains Apaches. Uh, some estimates had it as high as 3,000, probably closer to the first number, 1,400, 1,500. But still, you got 400 people, uh, and they've got 1,400. Even though, you know, you have uh, superior weaponry, that's not, uh, that's not a comfortable position to be in. However, he had manned the defenses uh, in some uh, very uh, smart tactical ways, uh, and he was able to, his men were able to uh, sustain their fire and hold back the charging Indians, and the, uh, the howitzers certainly helped, right, lobbing those shells into the midst of, into the, midst of the Indians, but uh, they started to realize they were running low on ammunition. The, the Indians, meanwhile, uh, had figured out that even though it's kind of crumbling, it's still a fort and they've got cannons in it and just uh, rushing straight at it, even if you outnumber them, isn't very effective. So they set a prairie fire um, that uh, the winds were going to be pushing right toward the fort, hoping to burn them out. And this probably would have worked uh, if uh, they weren't dealing with someone who was well-versed in their, uh, their ways of warfare because uh, Colonel Carson had been expecting that. And he had already set some small fires around the fort, burning off the grass, backfires, so that the, uh, the large fires that they set never reached the fort. Uh, and he used that as cover uh, to retreat and essentially get the heck out of there. Um, the, uh, the U.S. Army called this a victory. Um, the Comanches and Kiowas called it a victory on their side because they chased them away. And in fact, it was the U.S. Uh, forces that retreated. Ultimately, on the, uh, the U.S. side, there were six men killed and 25 wounded. It was impossible for them to know how many uh, of the Indians on the other side were were killed and wounded. They estimated around 60 total casualties, um, but only recovered one one dead body. Uh, you have to assume they killed more than one. Um, probably uh, 
uh, killed more of the Comanches and Kiowas than, than they lost. But again, if he had not immediately assessed the situation in that first Kiowa village, realized things were going south and that they needed to quickly fortify, and then had the foresight to set those backfires, um, we would probably be talking about the Carson Massacre. I think that um, most cavalry officers during that time period who were sent to serve um, in the Southwest, uh, most of them not having very much experience in that uh, environment and with those cultures, probably would have been uh, taken unawares and probably would have lost their, their command and their hair. So, you know, it's uh, really, it was maybe more of a draw um, and maybe not because the, the American forces did retreat. That would be the last time that uh, the Comanches slash Kiowas would be able to make the U.S. military retreat. In the coming decade, there'd be a lot more fighting uh, and uh, the numbers were going to be on the side of the U.S. Army after the Civil War was over. And by the way, notice this is called the First Battle of Adobe Walls. That implies there's a second and indeed there will be, uh, and it's even more dramatic than this one, but it happens about uh, 10 years down the road. So we'll get to that one later. 